today. My name is Brandon Inouye. I'm the Director of Sales for CPA Site Solutions. Uh, just a little background on myself. I've been in the uh, marketing industry for about 12 years, consulting uh, small to medium-sized businesses, uh, helping them with their marketing efforts, including uh, website, lead generation, social media, print advertising, mobile marketing, lead conversion, uh, lead tracking, all that fun stuff. Also joining us, we have Todd Steinberg. Todd is the Executive VP of Sales and Marketing for NCI, also known as New Clients, Inc. Uh, Todd brings more than 20 years of experience emphasizing sales, marketing, business development uh, in the industry of marketing, specifically for accounting services. Um, as the Director of NCI's Practice Development Coaching Program, and Director of Monitoring and Support. He's been responsible for leading NCI's Accounting Practice Sales Division and has been personally involved in the sale of over 125 different firms nationwide. So today we have a full hour booked here. We're going to be covering reaching new clients the new fashioned way. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Todd Steinberg. Brandon, thank you very much for that warm introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, we have a very jam-packed agenda, so I'm going to jump right in. We're going to kick things off with the value of an accounting practice. We'll talk about some goal setting, different ways to target and reach the market, appointment setting, the anatomy of the sale, and then I'll turn things back over to Brandon and they'll finish up with monitoring your marketing return on investment and managing your online reputation. I do want to point out that this webinar does qualify for one CPE credit. In order to be entitled to that credit, you must complete the survey and our polling questions. You'll see the survey at the end of the webinar today, and we're going to have a couple of polling questions that pop up throughout, so we appreciate your feedback as we move into the presentation here today. I always like to know some of your thoughts and how the process works in your mind. So let's talk a little bit about the value of an accounting practice. Many accountants see that as a great opportunity to jumpstart and give their firm a shot in the arm. Uh, the value of an accounting practice, most practices today selling for anywhere between 1 to 1.5, 2.5 times uh, revenue. And type of practice in terms of the client mix, profitability, sellers, transition assistance, staffing, situation, how much of the work is reoccurring, all these components go into the valuation process and how we would identify what would be a, a good multiple for a practice for sale. So there are some, some graphs that I wanted to show with you here today. Uh, we're going a little too far. Uh, let's see if we can go back here just a bit. Um, so here is supply and demand clearly rests with the seller. Uh, some positive add-ons in addition to the items that I mentioned, uh, payroll, more and more firms are integrating financial planning into their services, whether they spend the time and energy to become licensed and learn that profession or outsourcing that to a preferred partner. That's an area that seems to be expanding dramatically as accountants continue to reinvent themselves. And then also valuable services that carry a good multiple consulting engagements, whether it be QuickBooks consulting or it acting as a a CFO for hire or controller level services, these types of practices are very desirable in the open market. Being a broker at sales practices, <clears throat> I can tell you from experience when we get a listing, typically nine or ten buyers out there for every practice that's for sale. Great to know when you're ready to sell, not so good when you're looking to buy. Of course, when supply and demand favors the seller, you can expect to pay more in terms of a higher price and, uh, and more cash up front. Least desirable type of practice audit, not to say they don't have value, but a little bit more challenging uh, to sell an audit practice. So if you are looking for practices for sale in your area, we do have a list on our website, newclientsinc.com, of our current inventory. You might just want to bookmark that website and check it regularly as we do get listings nationwide from time to time. I like to show this graph because what this shows is the cost to generate $300,000 in revenue versus the cost to acquire $300,000 worth of revenue. This is a typical organic growth model where you're going to have some costs on advertising, sales and marketing personnel, lead sources, etc. But our experience has shown us that you can basically develop a practice for 50 cents on the dollar. These are your clients, not somebody else's. 
you've got your fingerprints all over it. You can continue to grow the practice, as you see here in this graph. When you buy clients, you don't learn anything about how to acquire them. So when normal attrition starts to creep in, you have to have a way to be able to replace those clients. If you just continue to run a marketing program for year two, three, four, some of your initial capital outlay will go a lot further than that one-time investment you made in the acquisition. Again, we're not trying to say buying a practice is a bad way to take your practice to the next level, um, but dollar for dollar, we believe organic growth can get you to the same place for a little bit less money. Mission statements. want to talk a little bit about defining your sense of purpose and creating a mission statement for your company. Most Fortune 500 companies, you turn to the inside cover of their annual report and you're going to see their mission statement. This is not just for small businesses, but from a sales and marketing perspective, being able to share that with not only clients, but prospective clients, what you're passionate about, why your company is in business. Extremely important to be able to share with prospects why you're doing what you do. So here are some thoughts in terms of being able to create a powerful mission statement. Goal setting. Don't think it, ink it. Write it down. If it's not written down, it's not a goal. You, know, you can have all the marketing strategies and processes and skills and degrees and credentials in the world, but unless you're laser focused on being able to accomplish the task at hand, whether it's growing your business, whether it's personal goals, physical goals, you name it, having a written plan, something magical happens when you write that down. So we ask you to, as you get ready, to begin the quest of growing your accounting practices or heck, taking on any other venture in your life to sit down and really start doing some planning, both personal, business financial, physical and emotional and spiritual. Here are just a few tips to keep in mind as you begin setting goals. Put a lot on your list. Those who expect little, guess what they get? A teensy little bit. Keep the goal sheets where they can be seen. What good is it to go through this process of doing all this planning to file it away and never to be seen or heard from again. Keep them very visible. Each time a goal is achieved, write the word victory next to it. Celebrate your accomplishments. Sign and date each goal sheet. Folks, there's no more important contract than the one you're going to sign with yourself. It adds a little bit of validity to what you're doing. And you may even want to share that with somebody that believes in you, an enabler, as I like to refer to them, somebody who's going to pat you on the back, pick you up when you're down, somebody who believes in you who can help you through some of those inevitable uh, ups and downs that are natural in, in going through any uh, accomplishment in life. So here's a good goal for you, the ability to live from your own financial resources. A lot of us leave jobs making good money to go out on our own. Uh, the ability to be able to call your own shots, do what you want when you want is a lot of freedom. It's kind of the American dream, right? So being able to create a statement of net worth, keep score. Are you gaining ground? Are you losing ground? Are you staying status quo? Okay, let's track how we're doing. We're all going to be somewhere in the next 10 years, so the question is where. Now is really the time to fix it. Next thing I wanted to discuss is targeting and reaching the market. So there's a lot of things that accountants can do to market their firm services. Hanging out a, a shingle and waiting for clients to come in the door, I think we can all agree that word of mouth and referrals are great when they happen, but in most cases you have to be more proactive. That's why you're on the webinar today, to learn a, a proven system and a model that's working here in 2015. So my colleagues at CPA Site Solutions will talk a bit later about web-based marketing strategies, uh, but one of the things that NCI has found in working with over 4,500 accounting firms over the last 30 years is that direct contact with another human being to say, hey, we're a local accounting firm. We concentrate on the needs of small to medium-sized businesses. Would you be interested in sitting down with a representative from our organization to discuss how we may be of service to you and your business? And that belly-to-belly -belly selling where you can go meet with a prospect face-to-face -face in what is a, inevitably a relationship business and having an accountant and explaining the features and benefits and the why about why they may want to consider your firm if they don't already have an accountant or why they may want to consider switching if they're currently working with another firm in your area. So we believe that good old-fashioned appointment setting. You can call it telemarketing if you want, ladies and gentlemen. I know when most folks hear that word telemarketing, it sends shivers up their spine. It's almost like as if it's a dirty word. But if done professionally, if you're combing through the general business population, looking to find people that have the need versus trying to create opportunities that don't already exist, if it's framed out properly, it's still in 2015 the most cost-effective way and the most results-oriented way to develop leads for your practice. I would tell you that the firms that are implementing the NCI model, 
about 80% of their leads are coming from direct marketing approach with appointment setting and then sending in either themselves or a representative of their firm, a salesperson to go and uh, present the services to prospective clients. Networking is a good idea. Um, in certain markets are more effective. Certain territories have better stick rates, whether it be your local BNI, Chamber of Commerce, LATIP groups. So you can just getting involved locally at that level. And of course, all the information that you'll hear from my colleagues at CPA Site Solutions from search engine optimization, AdWords, advertising, these things are all very important in today's day and age. So a very holistic approach that has several different uh, tentacles moving off of it. It's not just a one-size-fits-all. You have to be active in a lot of different spots if you're going to take advantage and be a leader in your marketplace in reaching the small to medium-sized business sector. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and, and shoot over to our first polling question here as part of today's session. So uh, go ahead and, and take a look at this question and let us know your thoughts. You'll see a yes or no button. If you'll click on that, I feel like I get all the leads that I need to grow my business. Your thoughts? You guys rolling in leads, or could you use some help in that area? What I hear from a lot of accountants that I speak to on a daily basis is that I feel confident that I can close the business if you can just get me in front of more prospects. So having qualified leads is a big concern for accountants out there. You know, one or two leads a month is not enough, especially knowing that we can't close 100% of the prospects we talk to. It very much is a numbers game, right? You got to have appointments to make presentations, and you have to make presentations in order to make sales. Okay, so I guess we'll close that question up and continue to move on here. Thank you for your feedback. Okay. With respects to lead sources, I want to share with you this slide here, different observations that you might have in terms of primary sources, secondary sources, and then personal observations. There's a lot of different places to go and gather the contact information of business owners to contact or to market to there in your area, from new registrations at the county clerk on the corporate level, new phone connects, liquor license, business journal newspapers. There are several list brokers out there cross-reference directory, chamber of commerce, attorneys, utility companies, and then things as a salesperson, taking off your accountant's cap for a moment and putting on a salesperson's cap. As you travel around your marketplace, there are things happening every day that you now need to identify as opportunities, grand opening signs, under new management, space for rent, job ads for bookkeepers, those little newspapers and shoppers guides, newly constructed shopping strips. So just be alert, be in tune to those opportunities there in your marketplace. They're extremely important, and you don't want to ignore them. I want to talk a little bit about appointment setting. I mentioned this is where about 80% of the leads are coming from with the NCI clients, which are at this point in the thousands that are operating this program across the country. When you work with that many accountants, you learn a thing or two about what works and what doesn't work. So I wanted to share a little bit about the expectations of if you are to put somebody on the phone, and I want to make this crystal clear. I would not recommend that you, the accountant, become an appointment setter. We suggest hiring somebody to do this for you, whether it be nine, ten, eleven dollars an hour, plus maybe a small bonus of twenty-five or fifty dollars, depending on your market across the country. That hourly hourly rate can vary slightly. Okay, but think about it this way: if you put somebody on the phone for what would be a twenty-hour-a-week shift, maybe a part-time job. Okay, and they made 20 dials an hour for you. You see here on the slide, that's in 40 minutes in parentheses. You can't expect somebody to dial 60 minutes without a break. They've got to take a little time away from the phone for rest and relaxation, recharge their batteries. They may have some paperwork to fill out. So 20 dials in an hour, that's about one call every two minutes. Some calls may take 15 seconds if it's not a good number or they leave a message. Others could be a five-minute conversation with a prospective client but on average 20 dials an hour is realistic. Contacts, what we would consider a contact would be 20% of the dials. So one out of every five calls we make is a decision maker, right? So we're already failing four out of five times, but if we're looking for those contacts, we're looking for those owners, and when we do get them on the phone, approximately 10% of them will result in an appointment. So if you run those numbers out, one or two appointments every four hours of calling, if we do that for 20 hours a week, 
and we get an appointment, let's just say, worst case scenario, every four hours, that would be five appointments with prospective clients in your marketplace. Ladies and gentlemen, you should be able to close 20% just by showing up with the right product at the right price at the right time. It's the other maybe 20, 30, 40% that you need to work for that's going to make the difference between you being a, a good salesperson and let's just say average or mediocre. So I wanted to spend you know, the last few minutes of time that I have here with you today to help in that very area, give you a little crash course on the anatomy of the sales process. We try to make this very, very simple for accountants. We have a four-prong approach, okay? That four-prong approach looks like this. You've got an introduction, which is also where you're going to develop rapport. This is where in a traditional selling environment, you, you get to know the, the salesperson, they ask some questions, and then they always tell you a little bit about the features and benefits, that's what you're going to do. And then all, they all f finish up with the close, which is what gives salespeople a bad name, right? So this process, while this is a three-step process, I want to turn it into a four-step process where we actually spend a couple of more opportunities here up front to kind of lump two categories in one. The intro is the rapport, right? So you've got to find some common ground. People like to buy from people like themselves. So to go in and just start analyzing financial data or asking somebody for an upfront commitment, if you don't have the trust, if you don't have the rapport, you are not going to get too far along in that sales process. So you've got to make them feel comfortable. That could be a 30-second warm-up. It could be a 10-minute warm-up, just depending on the prospective client. But don't just go in there and jump right into business. The second part of that process would be the probe. That's where you will we'll focus on what we would consider a fact-finding mission. This is where you're on a quest to determine the prospect's needs, wants, fears. Essentially, what you're looking for here is their buying motives. And good salespeople take the information that they learn in the probe, and as opposed to a canned pitch where you say this and they say that, right, which is the example on the last slide where we spent a little bit of time up front on the probe and then more time on the presentation and the close, here we spend the majority of our time up front. We're listening. This is why we have two ears and one mouth, so we listen twice as much as we talk. The idea is to be able to tailor our comments, tailor some of our statements to little sound bites that we know we're going to hit on all the key issues that they told us up front were important to them. Okay, So we'll touch on a couple of those probing questions here that we recommend you ask in a minute. And if you've done your job, you've done the fact-finding, you presented solutions to the client's problems, this last part of the sales call really should be nothing more than just getting the paperwork done. Either it's going to happen or it's not. This should not be a knockdown, drag them out process where we say whatever it takes to make the sale. Okay, Either we do it or we move on. I thought this was an interesting thing to share. There was a study that came out recently that talked about the three components of human influence being words, voice quality, and physiology. I was kind of surprised when I saw this that words only account for 7% of human influence? You mean what actually comes out of my mouth is less than 10% of the overall human influence factor? The voice quality and physiology, that means making sure that our body language, making sure that our tone, our pitch, our inflection, our pace, our eye contact, our hand gestures, our appearance, all these things have an important role in human influence. So I thought that was something important to share with you, ladies and gentlemen. There's also something in sales called the friend factor. And that states that people will not buy from you until they are generally convinced that you're their friend and that you're acting in their best interests. We say make a friend, make a sale. Okay? If you see yourself as a salesperson and go in with the mindset, what can I sell this person today, you're not going to have a lot of success out there in the world of sales and marketing. But selling an intangible, selling a service, if you can go in with the mindset of how can I help this person today, that advisor mentality, you're going to have a lot of success. There's nothing wrong with asking the prospect for a commitment and making money, and we're all in this to make money, but if you can help them accomplish what they're looking to accomplish and need to help them run their business smoothly and efficiently, and you can benefit from that as well financially and add a new client, then that, that's the definition of a win-win. Okay, the anatomy of the sale. The most powerful persuasion tool is belief. If you're not selling effectively, it is because you unconsciously believe that you are a taker and not a giver in this transaction. Persuasion success is assured if you truly believe that you're giving the client far more than what you're asking for in return. And every day you must 
believe to the true value of the services to your client. Okay, back to this little diagram here, the intro, the probe. I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, th those probing questions. Things like, what's the most important thing to you about the accounting firm you select? What tax saving strategies have you implemented in the last 12 months? What are you paying your current accountant? Find out transactional based questions so you know how to be able to develop a fee for that prospective client. Right? We want to be able to go on a fact finding mission and asking good questions. NCI has developed some tools we call the appointment report which has all these questions on there so that you don't have to be a hero and have them all committed to memory. You just go through this checklist not designed to be an interrogation but rather a friendly chat and kind of find out what that prospect's looking for. So if there's one takeaway from my presentation here today, I want you to remember this. Keep it in structure. Keep it in order. Don't bounce around. Tell them about who you are and the different services that you provide, and then develop rapport, then ask some questions, then close. Remember the four steps of the sales call. Develop some rapport in your introduction, then move into your probing questions, then talk about your features and benefits, and then lastly, you'll move into the close. As much as this can be complicated without personality types, then you have to throw in the fact that there are different types of people on this earth. There's the needs of daddy. You need to be able to know how to present to them. So I'm not going to read to you everything on each of these slides, but be conscious of the fact, cognizant of the fact that these are different personality types and need to be presented to accordingly. You have the young Mr. Business person. Right? They agree to talk because it makes good business sense. You know, They're looking for growth. Help them plan for the future. Then you have appropriately the, the old Mr. Businessman. Um, probably already has an accountant doing well, just really looking for tax savings and maybe saving some money on their accounting fees. So you got to cut to the chase with this person. You're not going to have time to go through the dog and pony show. They understand the value of an accountant in most cases. And then lastly, you have the co-conspirator, always looking to make their business better without having to pay taxes. I'm sure we've all run into a couple of these folks. So just be aware of those different personality types. Um, you'll be able to you know, pinpoint who you're talking to in a lot of cases and know how to, uh, to apply your sales strategies to those individuals. Fee setting. Everybody's got a little different formula based on their market. What I want to try to point out today is that to have a model where you can provide a service for a fixed monthly fee, gives the client an idea of exactly what you're getting every month and exactly what they're going to be charged. So the idea that you're going to have a flat value-based billing model where for X amount of dollars a month you're going to handle all their accounting services. Things like year-end tax work or other services outside the scope of a regular agreement that would provide monthly accounting well, would be additional billing opportunities. But to tell someone we're an accounting firm, we charge $200 an hour, and I'm not really sure how many hours it's going to take to handle your work throughout the year, but we'll pretty good, get a pretty good idea as we get going. Well, that doesn't make people feel warm and fuzzy, as opposed to saying we can do all your accounting for $300 a month, as an example, okay? And all we need today to get started is your approval on the first month's fee in order to get going. So uh, that's the way we like to frame it out, and I see a lot of success out there with business owners that have a model where based on disbursements, complexity, number of employees, I'm sure we could sit down and, and develop a model uh, internally that would work for your firm. NCI has some thoughts on that if you want to discuss that with us. We have a whole fee-setting model, which unfortunately we don't have time to walk through in its entirety today. Uh, but the idea is strike while the iron is hot, while they're under the ether. If you can't give them a fee right there on the initial sales call, once you walk out that door, only bad things can happen, right? So we want to be able to give them an accurate quote right there on the spot. And the last thing that I wanted to touch on here before I turn things back over to Brandon is I wanted to talk about the close, right? So we don't want to be pushy. We don't want to be high pressure. We want to know that there are some very relaxed ways, some very effective ways to be able to close the sale in meeting with small business owners. So the first one is an assumptive close, using words like we're going to, I'd like to, all I need to do to get started is. So an example of an assumptive close would be, Mr. Smith, we can handle all your accounting for only blank dollars a month. All I need to get started today is your approval and a check for X amount of dollars as opposed to saying, I think we can probably do this for about or somewhere around. Accountants are notoriously weak when it comes to asking for money. That's a generalization, but I've found that to be true over time. And it's a matter of just being confident and saying it like you mean it. We undervalue the services that we provide. 
So we have to say it in a manner that connotates we're, we're professional, we're, we're going to be asking for it, and we're going to say it like we mean. And we're going to do all this for only, I think, is a great way to be able to, to do that. We're very assumptive because we think we're the best. We, we know we can provide a good value. And back to the slide I showed earlier, we're going to give them far more than what we're asking for in return. The action close involves getting the client involved in some physical aspect of sale. Trying to create a sense of urgency with people. We know there's a lot of things that are working and commanding for their hard-earned dollars, right? We've got to make our reasons to join forces with your firm today stronger than their reasons to put this off till tomorrow. So have them fill out some type of a return. Have them start giving you some accounting records. Deal with a penalty letter or some type of interest letter that they got from the IRS or the state. You know, they can be your best ally in order to get people moving and taking action quickly. Let them know uh, some of the drawbacks of waiting um, to, to get started. So creating that sense of urgency with an action close is extremely important. The next one up on the deck here is the post-dated check. So we've all run into situations where we're meeting with a prospect and they tell us, I have to speak to my spouse. I have to speak to my business partner. They essentially have to get clearance from a third party. Well, to continue to ask for the check there could be considered a little bit pushy. But if we say something like this, this might give you the flexibility to still walk out of there with a, with a commitment. I understand, Mr. Jones, that you need to speak it over with your business partner. Why don't we do this? You seem to be in agreement that our services are what you're looking for, and I'm looking to get their head nodding. I want to make sure that they, the person I'm sitting with, agrees to the value of the services that we provide. If they don't think this is for them, then this post-dated check may not be the right close. But if they just need to get clearance from another person, you can roll this one out and say, why don't you post-date me a check for three days, and for some reason your business partner isn't completely on board with this decision. I'm sure they will be. It seems to apparent to me that your firm is in the market for a new accountant. And if for some reason they're not interested in moving forward, just give me a call by Friday. No harm, no foul. I'll send you your check back and life goes on. You're busy. I'm busy. This way we can get some of the initial paperwork out of the way. And uh, if there's any snag here in the process, you let me know. So that post-dated check, if positioned properly, can work very, very well. The silent close. Getting to the end of the list here, gang. The silent close Sometimes a well-timed silence has more impact than the words that come out of our mouth. You know, oftentimes when people are nervous, they talk, 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 talk. But if you've said what you need to say, if you're seeing buying signals from the prospective buyer, stop talking and ask for the money. All we need to get started is this. So you're putting some delicate pressure on the prospect to make a decision. But at some point, if you just keep on talking, I've seen people talk themselves right out of a sale. So if you're seeing some signals, go in and ask for the commitment. The Ben Franklin close. This is a great technique. This is called the Ben Franklin close because when Mr. Franklin had an important decision to make in his life, he would do a little reasons to do it, reasons not to do it, and put together a little chart, a T-chart. So here, we want to compare apples to apples. Maybe somebody is currently working with a bookkeeper, all right, and they're not getting tax planning advice. They're not working with the CPA. They're not having all their forms filed. You want to be able to stack the deck, tip the scales, whatever term you want to use, so that if you're going to be asking potentially for more money uh, than what they're currently paying, you be, better be able to justify the value of the services that you provide. Maybe it's them doing their accounting services themselves. They think they're saving money by doing it themselves. Well, you need to point out to them in a little reasons to stay, reasons to go, reasons to do, reasons not to do, all the benefits they're going to have of joining forces with your firm. So that's extremely important in the right circumstances and can really help the prospect visualize what they're getting from you uh, versus continuing to be the status quo. Last but not least, I want to talk about the West Coast Close. This is also called the Results Assurance Program. Essentially what we're saying here is that you'll be offering a money-back guarantee to a prospective client. It will work something like this. Or a prospect oftentimes will say, I want to think about it. Well, we all know <laughs> That doesn't necessarily always mean that they're sharing with you 100% of their reasons for maybe wanting to just be a delay tactic, or maybe they really just don't like to make decisions on the spot. You can't call them out on that. But what we can say is, specifically, is there anything that you want to think about? Let's try to isolate the objection and overcome it if we can. Maybe there's something that we haven't explained properly or thoroughly. But if they say, no, 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 I just need some more time. I'm not ready to commit today. It's a big decision. Why don't we say something like this? 
why don't you take 90 days, Mr. Prospect, to think about our services? And while you're thinking about it, you could be benefiting from our services at the same time. If after 90 days you're not completely satisfied with our work and professional input, you just let me know. I'll not only send you all your monthly fees back, but we'll cancel the arrangement. No harm, no foul, and life goes on. Now, notice what I didn't say. I didn't say we're going to give them all their money back, just on the monthly fees. So if you did tax work or other special projects, that's not refundable. I don't know that I would lead with this technique on every call, but if somebody's questioning the value or they're a little unsure, maybe you have a little certificate, a guarantee certificate that you can give them, add some tangibility to the sale that states that you're willing to work with them on a trial basis. Not many accountants are willing to do that, uh, but that puts your money where your mouth is and you're giving them an opportunity to try it out and, and see if they like it. My experience has been people don't like to change. If they're going to give you their business, as long as you do what you say you're going to do, you shouldn't have much to worry about. Okay, um, So that's six different closing techniques that I feel can be very beneficial if applied properly to small business owners. Okay, We'll have our contact information here up at the end of the webinar. I hope we provided you with some, some value here today. And uh, if I can be of any assistance to anyone on the call in regards to building, buying, or selling a practice, please visit us online at newclientsinc.com. Thanks for your attention, everybody, and I'm going to pass it back to Brandon. Thank you, Todd. Very good, very good. Ben Franklin's one of my favorites. I, uh, I definitely have uh, taught and uh, used that one before. It's great. So, team, we're going to switch focus here from sales over to some marketing um, strategies which as you guys know, sales and marketing both uh, go hand in hand. So what's your marketing ROI or return on investment? So the marketing ROI problem, uh, as far back as the late 1800s, uh, John Wanamaker was quoted as saying, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. So some of us that may uh, hit closer to home than others, but traditional advertising, I mean, they face a similar problem with companies allocating 60% of their media budget to television, when only 18% of TV advertising campaigns actually generate a positive ROI, a return on investment, and that's according to Nielsen. So the ROI objective, so investment priorities plus communication channels equals maximum return. So the core objective in measuring return on investment of your marketing initiatives is to prioritize your investment in relevant communication channels in ways that deliver maximum returns, obviously, for your firm. So the challenge of getting new clients. So you'll see here, 55% here of is time to get everything done, 43% managing everything myself, money to invest in my ideas, generating quality leads, converting those leads into customers, money to add employees to my company, and then marketing ex expense finally. So everyone here, unless your firm is on autopilot, spends a lot of effort thinking of how to get new clients. So a recent study of small business owners found this out when they were thinking about the challenges and how do they find those new clients. So with time, you're spending most of your time making sure you have happy clients. And with money, we want to make sure that you're spending money in the right way. That's crucial. We want to make sure that we're maximizing our return on every marketing dollar that we spend. So traditional marketing uh, activities. So you'll see 72% customers and referrals and word of mouth. 46% is through networking. 26% events or event sponsorships. And then 21% through direct mail and flyers. As we know, word of mouth, happy clients equal happy referrals that we generate. You'll see on the lower end we have print ads, TV and radio ads, and then other lead generation methods. So these are all the most popular offline lead generation activities that we see typical small medium sized businesses spending their money on. So next we have our second poll question. So we just looked at some traditional offline marketing. Let's go ahead and take the time to answer this poll. So I spend money on online marketing less than I do on traditional marketing, about the same as traditional marketing, or more than I do on traditional marketing? And there's, uh, there's no wrong answer here. <laughs> uh, 
All right, everyone voted. Appreciate your votes. All right, so our most common traditional marketing tools that we're going to look at here. Yellow Pages advertising comes in at about 41%. Brochures in at 37%. Print advertising, 35%. Direct mail, 31%. Lunch and learn, 29% message on hold 29% and then lastly radio at 6%. So there's nothing wrong with traditional marketing. In fact, it is an important component of a good marketing strategy. Digital marketing or online marketing, however, is definitely taking off. So the facts are online marketing outperforms all forms of traditional advertising. And combining both traditional and digital or online marketing will actually result in the highest return on investment. So the takeaway here is online marketing isn't an either or, but it should be a blend with traditional advertising. We're not saying stop all traditional advertising, but businesses who market uh, primarily focused on traditional advertising should migrate their budgets towards digital marketing. And a study by Microsoft used big data to measure the exact ROI of digital marketing both with and without advertising. And they found digital marketing outperforms all forms of traditional advertising, whether it's TV, print, radio, outdoor. So while combining both resulted in the highest ROI. So, you know, digital marketing, again, we're not looking at an either or here, but businesses whose media spend is still focused on traditional advertising, advertising, they should be blending those and also investing into digital marketing. So we looked at the most common traditional uh, marketing earlier. So these are the most commonly found online marketing tools. About 84% is in website. You got 59% in Facebook, 29% in Google+, 16% in Twitter, you got YouTube with 16%, Yelp at 14%, and 3% with Pinterest. Obviously, a lot of social media outlets there as well. So number one, online marketing activities are interconnect, uh, interconnected. So it is a multi-prong marketing strategy that you need to be using. So you have to pay attention to the feedback, feedback loop. You'll notice on the right-hand side here, the website is really the focal point of all advertising. Everything is interconnected. A lot of cross traffic that happens. So my first power tip for measuring the ROI of digital marketing is understanding the complex set of activities and interrelationships among activities resulting in a positive return on investment. So for example, a focus on building a social media community backfires quickly if you have problems with patient or client satisfaction or poor product performance all you've done is given disgruntled clients a platform for complaining about your product or your service. So you can't just have a website and say, I'm done. A website that isn't optimized by, say, an SEO team, for example, and it's not found. And we want, obviously, your website to be found. So having a strong social media presence can backfire if you have a challenge with client satisfaction. Number two. Online marketing activities are interrelated. So we touched on this a little bit earlier, but you'll see here in the green, you'll see a spike in usage when it has a website and social media. You'll see in the dark area, it is without a website, just using social media. And activities are much higher when they're interconnected, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, you name it. So if you're in the digital world, you must literally be in the digital world. It's sort of a pass-fail grade. You must use multiple online tools to maximize your potential marketing impact. Number three, measure what matters. So clicks are nice. Engagement is valuable. Clients are the goal. So we need to determine what's most important to you. Is it more clients? Is it fee for, fee for service? Uh, Long-term clients that you're looking for and retention, less attrition. Is it setting clear goals for what you want to achieve? So often you'll find that digital marketers are measuring the easy things, you know, like we mentioned, likes, clicks, things like that. These are important. However, they're not the most important or only important aspect of a successful digital marketing campaign. So first we need to set clear goals for your digital marketing campaign. 
goals that go deeper than just outcome performance measures. So next we're going to touch on online marketing components and we're going to talk about websites and your style and sort of your branding element. So first off, your web sh website should have a compelling style um, and if you don't have a website you should definitely get one. Um, next you need to reflect your firm work on all devices. It needs to be compatible with tablets. It needs to be responsive and able to be viewable on uh, mobile devices, uh, monitor. It doesn't matter what platform your consumer is viewing your website on. It needs to be responsive and adaptive to that specific um, device. So also we want to make sure that your website uh, is optimized for these because Google just changed their ranking system. So if you're not responsive or mobile adaptive, um, then it can actually hurt your rankings on the search engines when searched from a smartphone. So this is an example of a branded website. Um, we aren't going to go into the details of the content and all that, but a simple example of uh, one of the designs that we can build. When it comes to SEO or search engine optimization, this is the activity of ensuring a website can be found by search engines not necessarily a DIY, do-it-yourself type of a thing. There's a lot of words and phrases that are relevant to what your site is offering. Um, you want to make sure that it's, it's quality control for your website. Content is king and it does help you with higher ranking sites. Popularity is also another thing that can go into placing higher in Google, Yahoo, being any of the top search engines. You want to get your business noticed. Um, it is the search engine's way of ranking sites among a number of possibilities. So you need to ensure that you're found. It comes down to regular updating of content that shows you're current. You want to combine that with social media and you want to make sure that the right keywords all play a role in getting your site ranking higher. Some tips, we want to make sure that the content is descriptive and interesting. We also want to make sure it's obviously relevant to your firm and what you offer and the types of clients that you want to attract. We want to use key phrases, not just key words. We want to use social media to drive people to your website. Again, we showed earlier how it's all interconnect interconnected and you get cross traffic through all those channels. Um, lastly, we want to get experts in SEO to help you, not something that usually we would recommend you try to do to your, do on your own because it's a very complicated system. This is simply an example of some analytics of sessions. So how long are people going to your site? How many page views are you getting? Bounce rate of a typical website. So how many people are going to your site leaving right away? How many are sticking? This is an example of traffic. Where is it coming from? my traffic coming from an organic search? Are they finding me in Google, Yahoo organically, meaning without having to pay for it? Is it direct, meaning are people going straight to www.brandoncpa.com and typing that into their browser? Are they coming from a social network? Are they going to my website from Facebook or LinkedIn? Um, and lastly, is it a referring link that they're coming from? So next we're going to talk about pay-per-click. So I'm sure some of us have heard of pay-per-click, maybe have used it before. So pay-per-click provides targeted leads to your firm. So with a lion's share of PPC market or pay-per-click market being roughly 67%, the use of Google AdWords, which is Google's pay-per-click campaigns, is a no-brainer. I mean, there's plenty of businesses that have driven traffic to their site, marketed their products, services, and ultimately increased sales by leveraging Google AdWords. Um, I know there are some business owners who stay away from PPC or pay-per-click because they believe it eats it into a large portion of their marketing spend. Unfortunately, they're making a big mistake because AdWords delivers measurable results and is definitely worth the investment. So for those of us who aren't familiar, um, the paid advertising that you'll see here, if you look up here, these top three that say ad next to them, this is through Google's AdWords or pay-per-click. Also on the right here, this is also Google AdWords, and these are all ones where people are paying per click um, for that placement. So benefits. Again, you get immediate results from day one. The second you get it up, you can drive traffic to your site right away. You also get measurable results. You can track the leads. 
It's more cost effective than any other advertising method. Maintenance is easy as long as you have someone helping you with the management program and you can start, stop and pause it at any time. So it's not like you're locked in for a year, two years of using it forever. Um, it's something that you can turn on and off and pause on and off throughout any given month. Some tips. So do not sign up for more than three to six months initially. Most vendors that are out there want 12 month contracts. But if they don't deliver the results you were told to expect, you don't want to keep throwing money you know, after bad results. So make sure that you get out early for poor results. Now make sure you know who will be managing your campaign. Is it a person or is it some automated robot? Uh, many SEM programs are fully automated and lack the fine tuning of a program that can be run by a really highly trained person. If it is a person, is it a customer service rep or is it a trained search engine marketing specialist? Big difference. Can you call a specific person anytime to discuss your campaign? Um, can you get their name, email, and phone extension? Usually a dedicated account manager or a dedicated campaign specialist are reserved for larger clients who spend $1,000 or more per month on their search engine marketing spend. Next, they should definitely train you on how to understand their dashboard. So all legitimate search engine marketing vendors offer an online dashboard that will allow you to track campaign results, usually in real time. So this is how you can tell, you know, exactly is my program working for me or, you know, do I need to make some adjustments or does my search engine marketing specialist need to make some adjustments for me. They should be able to walk you through how to interpret all the graphs, tables, and gauges on your password secure dashboard. And make sure you spend enough too. After the vendor develops your initial set of keywords and geo targets, ask them to show you what the average cost of those keyword and geo combinations is. To run a decent program, you want to get at least 100 clicks a month. Now that number of 100 clicks a month is based on an average of 10 clicks generating one action. So for example, a phone call or purchase or other conversion. So your ratio may be higher or lower, but if, you, if your average cost per click is, say, six bucks, then your minimum monthly spend should be $600. And spending less will mean that you, know, you likely won't get as many new clients. How much of your monthly fee goes towards spend is another good question to ask here. So the spend is the amount of money paid directly to the search engine. So that would be Google, Yahoo, or Bing. The rest of the fee is the management fee for the service provider. So if your monthly spend is below $500, the management fee should be in the 50% to 100% range. So spends between $500 to $5,000 a month should generate management fees in the 25% to 40% range. So if your spend is over $5,000 a month, you know, your management fee should be 20% or less. So social media advertising, it's estimated that social media advertising revenue in 2015 will be close to $8.5 billion. And it's set to witness explosive growth in the next few years. Clearly it's doing something right. So social media is a top internet activity and people across all age groups, not just you know the, the young millennials, but literally all age groups are spending a large amount of time on social media. So you've got a really good chance of catching their attention through social media advertising. So some tips. If you want to boost social media ads, um, return on investments, here's a few things that you can keep in mind. So whether it's Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, or promoted tweets, you'll want to optimize the use of their targeted features. So you can actually drill deep down into terms of client profiling so that your ads reach clients or users who have a better chance of converting into your next client. Your ads will appear directly in those users' news feeds, so you can also avoid repeat messaging in that as well. You want to rotate your ads. Many users access their social media accounts with their smartphones, so you'll obviously want to make sure too that your ads are mobile friendly and you want to get an expert to help you out with that. This would be a simple example of a social media post um, that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. 
Um, we obviously want to focus on generating likes, shares, engagement, all those types of things. Next is email marketing. So it is the lowest cost per lead of all. So if you've been ignoring emails as an advertising channel because you might think it's outdated, well, we need to think again because email marketing, again, it's the lowest cost per lead and it should be a, dig a digital channel that you leverage to the hilt. So according to a survey by the Radicati Group, there will be more than 1.1 billion business email accounts by 2017 and 77% of worldwide email accounts will be consumer email accounts. So imagine the sheer advertising opportunity that's offered by email. It's bigger than huge. It's literally ginormous. Next, personal referrals. So we all love referrals, obviously. It's still number one. You always want to ask, whoop, let's go back here, current slide. All right. So you always want to ask every client how they found you. Very important. Um, ask clients for referrals. You want to reward your top referral sources. You also want to make sure your business is worth referring. So, you know, word of mouth and um, repeat and referral business, always something that we want to look to um, continue to grow year in and year out. So, a summary here is an integrated marketing strategy becoming more important. Consider migrating more marketing dollars online. Uh, measure what you spend and always enhance your visibility through uh, software tools. And again, on the right there, you'll see all these things are connected, really important to understand. It's not just about a website or just about SEO or just about social media. You want to make sure, all, make sure that all your platforms are interconnected and working as one. So if you don't have time to spend on online marketing, we can definitely help. Uh, at CPA Site Solutions, we focus on uh, website design, social media management, pay-per-click and search engine optimization. Um, our website is cpasitesolutions.com. All right, lastly, we want to thank you for join, join, joining our uh, webinar today. Um, if you guys do have any questions, we can't hear you through the audio, but feel free on the right-hand side to ask questions to myself or Todd, and we have, we'd be happy to answer those. Um, Thanks again for attending, and remember that once you exit this webinar, uh, you will be prompted for a survey to get your one hour of CP and marketing credit. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to use the question uh, chat on the right there. Otherwise, thanks again for joining, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.